The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Good afternoon. It's an honor this afternoon to welcome Honors Phil Rasmussen, the Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to the University of Chicago. Mr. Rasmussen has a long and distinguished career in public service in Denmark, in Europe, and internationally. First elected to the Danish Parliament at age 25, he rose rapidly to ministerial rank and to the leadership of Denmark's Liberal Party. In 2001, the parliamentary elections gave the Liberals the right to form the government, and Mr. Rasmussen became Denmark's Prime Minister, a position he held through two more elections and seven and one-half years. Among his many accomplishments as Prime Minister, during Denmark's presidency of the European Union in 2002, he played a key role in concluding the extension negotiations for 10 candidates for EU membership. Upon his election as Secretary General of NATO in 2009, he resigned his post as Denmark's Prime Minister, and in August 2009, he assumed office as NATO's 12th Secretary General. Please join me today in welcoming Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen. Mr. Dean, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words of uh, welcome and introduction. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure uh, for me to be here uh, at the University of uh, Chicago, and I'd like to thank the University and uh, the Chicago Council on, on Global Affairs uh, for uh, hosting me. I'm happy to be here for a couple of uh, reasons. First, because Chicago is the hub of the Midwest, far from uh, Washington. Not that I have anything against uh, your capital, uh, on the contrary. But the fact is that politicians uh, from other countries like me usually only have time uh, when we come to the United States to go to uh, Washington, uh, meet our counterparts, and fly out. We don't get out of the Beltway. I think it's important to get around the country and meet people from diverse backgrounds. Um, the American actor, Michael Douglas, once said, I'm impressed with the people uh, from Chicago. Hollywood is hype, New York is talk, Chicago is work. And indeed, Chicago is uh, a dynamic city uh, which has preserved the traditional and solid values from the Midwest. So I'm glad to be able to come here and to have a discussion uh, with you. I'm also pleased to be here because it is a university, a place to think, to reflect, and to learn lessons with an eye to the future. That's exactly what I want to do in my remarks today, and I welcome the opportunity. You won't be surprised to hear that much of my day is spent on the management of the organization, NATO, and our operations, most obviously uh, Afghanistan. I spend a lot of time trying to get one ally to contribute more trainers or another to agree to pay for a critical military capability or in the media trying to maintain support uh, for the mission in countries where people are often very skeptical. But it has now been more than eight years since this operation began, longer than the entire Second World War. I think 
the time has come also to take a step back, lift our eyes from the day-to-day -day issues, and draw some lessons. Formal work on that should start soon in NATO headquarters in Brussels. But I'd like to use the opportunity of being here today to offer some initial thoughts of my own. This is more than just academic, even if we are in uh, a lecture hall. At the end of this year, uh, NATO heads of state and government, including President Obama, will agree a new strategic concept, a guiding document for NATO, which we publish uh, about once every 10 years. It will set out what NATO should do, where it should be done, and how for the coming decade. The work on developing it is fully underway. Madeleine Albright, who is heading up a team of experts, will submit an initial proposal to me in a few weeks. I have no doubt that the lessons we have learned in Afghanistan will help shape this very important strategic concept. Let me start by taking you back to my third day in this job, the 5th of August last year. At 6 in the morning, I boarded a US Air Force C-17 transport aircraft in Brussels and flew to Afghanistan. I wanted to see firsthand how the operation was going and how the new commander, General McChrystal, intended to conduct it. As soon as I arrived, General McChrystal took me into his briefing room in ISAF headquarters and put up onto a big screen a graphic display of all the factors, military and civilian, we had to take into account if we are to succeed, and all the interconnections between them. I tell you, there were hundreds of lines going in every direction. It looked like someone had dumped a huge pot of cooked spaghetti onto the projector. The complexity of that graph was intended to make a very simple point. Everything is connected. In Afghanistan, there can be no development without security. But equally, there can be no lasting security without development. Let me give you an example. NATO and Afghan forces have just cleared Madhya, an area in Helmand province that has been a center of Taliban activity and of opium production. The Taliban have no more safe haven there. Does that mean that the operation was a success? Not yet. The people who live there need to see that their kids get schooling, that there is health care, that the police provide security rather than shaking down the population themselves. If those thing, things don't happen, the people in Madhya will continue to reject their government. The Taliban will be back and the success of the military phase, in which 12 NATO soldiers died, will have been for nothing. Which brings me back to the spaghetti chart and to my first lesson learned. When I saw it, I congratulated General McChrystal on his analysis, because I agree. Everything is indeed connected. The military mission can ultimately succeed until the civilian aspects, better governance, improved development, and a rising economy succeed. But my first questions were these. Who is going to do all these things? And how do we ensure that what 
everyone is doing is coherent and mutually reinforcing rather than simply running on separate tracks? The answer is that we need what we call a comprehensive approach. And that is the first lesson of this mission. The days when the military could defeat the enemy, then hand the baton off to the civilians and go home, are past us. And Afghanistan is not unique. There are 16 major armed conflicts underway today. All of them are within rather than between states. <clears throat> In many cases, it is the basic pillars of society that need to be rebuilt. This means that the military and civilians need to work much more closely than they have in the past. <clears throat> that might seem obvious and easy to do, but it isn't. And there is a bit of a strange paradox in how this has evolved. At the national level, NATO governments have generally moved towards a whole-of-government approach to Afghanistan. Diplomats, defense ministries, and development experts sit together, plan together, and operate together, including in provincial reconstruction teams all over Afghanistan. But at the international level, this lesson has simply not yet been learned. Let me illustrate it by a concrete example. The European Union does both development and police training in Afghanistan. Nevertheless, the EU and NATO do not plan or coordinate together for political reasons totally separate from Afghanistan. The same is basically true of NATO and the United Nations. And I consider this to be an unacceptable waste of resources and effectiveness. The lack of communication with non-governmental organizations is also striking. Recently, I suggested publicly that we needed to work more closely with NGOs so that their soft power could complement our hard power. Their reaction, I can tell you, was not very receptive. I think they are worried about becoming a party to a conflict. They wish to remain neutral. Therefore, they are often reluctant to work under military protection. I fully understand the, those objections. But we have to discuss this and work it through. Because in a situation where everything is connected, but where NATO cannot do everything, there must be more discussion and, where appropriate, more coordination between the military and civilian sites from the planning stages to field operations. In peacetime, we must get to know each other and train together for the inevitable moment when we are thrown together in a real crisis. <clears throat> We also need to look within NATO at what civilian roles the alliance itself might need to develop. We have put a senior civilian representative in Afghanistan to work the political issues alongside the military commander. It's a first. Some were un uh, uncomfortable uh, when we put this in, in place, but it's necessary, and it might be necessary again. To my mind, none of this is abstract theory. The less effective we are at adopting a comprehensive approach, the longer it will take for this mission to succeed. Last year, NATO lost more than one soldier per day, on average, in Afghanistan. 
that math is clear, and behind the math are lost lives. It must not be ignored. We cannot allow old thing to hold us back. The cost is far too high. And this brings me to my second lesson. We don't just need better relations with other international organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations. To my mind, NATO also needs to institutionalize a broad and inclusive security dialogue and, where appropriate, partnership with relevant countries from around the world. Now, this might seem non-controversial to you, and frankly, I think it should be. But some fear NATO stretching itself too thin. Others are afraid that NATO wants to rival the United Nations. For these reasons, among others, there is hesitation about NATO engaging more systematically with countries like India and China. And these are understandable concerns, but I think they can be addressed. Afghanistan is proof, to my mind, of the vital importance of broader partnerships for successful international missions. We already have 45 countries in the NATO-led mission, 28 NATO countries, and now 17 non-NATO as well. That alone is a powerful political coalition, which has stuck together and even grown despite the difficulty of this mission. But I believe we need to go further to engage countries that don't necessarily send troops, but that have a clear interest in the outcome. Let me mention Pakistan, India, and China in particular. Another stakeholder is Russia. Afghanistan is not an island. To me, it only makes sense to engage in dialogue with them on how to best work together to help bring peace and security to Afghanistan. The key word is cooperative security. If we are to accomplish a military mission or prevent conflict, we must engage with the relevant major actors and stakeholders. NATO should become a place where our global partners can come and discuss security issues of common concern. And Afghanistan is a case in point. Those are two overarching political lessons learned. The need for a comprehensive approach to peace operations and the importance of developing our partnerships. I hope to see both in the new strategic concept. But of course, we have also learned a number of practical military lessons as well. The most obvious is the need to reform our militaries. I will uh, certainly not bore you with the technical details of the Indian power of transport helicopters or the effect of heat and hate of their ability to fly. But what it boils down to is this. We have huge legacy armed forces left over from the Cold War. Millions of soldiers, but too few able to be sent overseas to fight. Huge stockpiles of tanks and fighter aircraft we don't use, but not enough big transport aircraft to get us where we need to go. And yes, helicopters unable to fly in the hate and heat of Afghanistan, where we actually need them. A lot has already been done to transform NATO's armed forces 
The United States is undoubtedly miles ahead of most other NATO countries because you have always built your forces for expeditionary uh, operations. <clears throat> but Afghanistan has taught us all that we need to build much more deployable forces. That we need to team up to buy the kind of transport or logistics that might be too expensive for individual countries. And that we need to cut back on fixed infrastructure to invest in new capabilities. While the list of urgent requirements is long, there is one in particular that I think doesn't get enough attention. The ability to train. In 2001, Afghanistan basically had no state structures left. No national government, no army, no police. Everything had to be built from scratch. The truth is that we took far too long to realize that. To realize that until the Afghans are capable of providing security, we will have to do it. Which means that training Afghan security forces isn't a secondary or tertiary military mission. It is at the core of our eventual exit strategy. We should have factored training of lo local security forces into our thinking and our planning from the beginning. We didn't. But last year, we finally set up a NATO training mission to oversee the training of Afghan police and Afghan army. That's the kind of thing we must keep in mind for any future mission. But we also need to have the trainers to do the job. And we don't. In fact, it is easier to get a battalion of 800 infantry soldiers than it is to get 50 trainers to deploy into a war zone. Armies have lots of battalions and platoons and brigades, but they have never really planned and prepared to train others, police even less so. Which is why the fourth lesson I've drawn from the Afghanistan mission is that NATO needs to develop training as a core capability. And NATO countries, the member states, need to do the same. And we need to build these capabilities so that they are ready and deployable when we need them. Of course, NATO's core business is and will remain the defense of our territory and our populations. But today, that can sometimes um, mean going far from our physical borders, even to cyberspace. That expeditionary focus will also need to be an important part of the new strategic concept. Ladies and gentlemen, these are important lessons learned from Afghanistan. First, there is no military solution to conflict solely. We must strengthen the interaction between military security and civilian development, a comprehensive approach. Second, we must engage in dialogue and consultation with important actors and stakeholders by developing our global partnerships. Third, we must reform our militaries and build more deployable forces. Fourth, we must develop a capacity to train and educate local 
security forces. And finally, there is one more lesson I believe we should take away from this mission. The power and the potential of NATO. Now, I know that some in the United States complain that NATO is too cumbersome, too bureaucratic, and too complicated for the Afghan mission. And I have to tell you, I'm the first to oppose bureaucracy, believe me. But when I look at this operation, I see something different. I see the solidarity of all NATO allies on display. On September 11, 2001, the United States was attacked by terrorists. The day after, on September 12, NATO allies invoked Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, the article which states that an attack on one NATO member state is considered an attack on all allies. For the first time in the history of NATO, allies invoked our collective defense agreement. That was true solidarity. And it is as strong as ever today. I see that the number of countries under the NATO umbrella has now risen to 45, despite all the casualties and all the challenges. I see that 40% of the 100,000 troops come from non-US countries. And I see that non-US countries take about 40% of the casualties as well. True burden sharing. To my mind, a fundamental lesson of Afghanistan is that NATO can take on the toughest operation in the world, maintain its unity and its cohesion and its strength over years in the most challenging conditions. And I'm quite sure prevail. I believe that when this mission is complete, the Alliance will emerge stronger, more effective, and more united than ever. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Secretary General Rasmussen has kindly agreed to take uh, questions. We have about 20 minutes, and I would like to remind everybody that they should remain seated uh, for the full 20 minutes. Uh, the way this will work is we have people on the left and people on the right with microphones. Neither the Secretary General nor I can see them because we're <laughs> blinded by the Klieg lights. But I'll just assume that they're out there, and they will pick the individuals. I would ask you when you uh, put your question or your statement forward that you try to keep it to 30 seconds. Uh, and, uh, and then Secretary Rasmussen uh, will answer it. Okay, so without further ado, we'll start on the left and uh, with the person with the microphone, pick out someone to uh, ask a question. Uh, just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, coming uh, to the University of Chicago. A uh, question I wanted to pose is you talked about how the technology was, um, NATO was in need of uh, improving technology and at the background of this we see uh, France contemplating a deal with uh, Russia selling a Mistral um, ship, a warship with advanced technology. I was wondering uh, what could you say about uh, is what is NATO doing about it? Is there any, any negotiations with France uh, about the deal? Thank you. Um, first of all, I have to say that uh, NATO is not engaged uh, in this uh, trade uh, arrangement. It is a bilateral arrangement between France uh, and uh, Russia. So NATO does not have any role uh, to play. Um, secondly, um, I take it for granted 
that uh, this sale of military equipment uh, will take place in fu full accordance with all international rules uh, and uh, regulations. Um, I know that uh, France uh, has taken and will take into consideration concerns raised by a number of uh, allies. And finally, let me say that I take it for granted uh, that Russia uh, will not uh, use or misuse uh, this military equipment against any ally or against any of uh, Russia's neighbors. Thank you. Do we have a question here on the right? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, I have a question uh, that goes in the following way. Uh, the justifications uh, for the war in Afghanistan uh, have changed over the years. Uh, moreover, many countries, uh, I'm thinking of Russia as an example, uh, looks at the war in a far different way than perhaps NATO uh, and the United States. Perhaps you can draw, <clears throat> perhaps you can give us an idea of how the ambitions and the ends of the war uh, are looked at uh, by NATO. Uh, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is very related as well. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the people uh, of Afghanistan uh, are promised health care, uh, security, etc. Can you maybe as well specify how the people uh, ought to understand the ends of the war uh, in order to convince them that uh, it's true that security is necessary and it's true that they should work uh, together with NATO and other allies? Thank you. The justification of, of the war I think it's uh, quite uh, straightforward. We know that the terrorists uh, who attacked the United States uh, on the 11th of September uh, 2001 were rooted uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, the purpose uh, of uh, our military operation in Afghanistan is to prevent Afghanistan from once again uh, becoming a safe haven uh, for terrorists. Uh, if we left Afghanistan, um, <clears throat> we risk uh, that terrorists uh, will again use Afghanistan as a launching pad uh, for terrorist attacks against the United States or Europe or elsewhere. Terrorists uh, could easily spread uh, from Afghanistan through Central Asia to Russia. Not to speak about the risk of destabilizing neighboring Pakistan, a nuclear power, <clears throat> and that would be uh, a very, very dangerous uh, situation. So this is the clear purpose of our mission in Afghanistan, security. We want to defend our populations against the threat uh, from uh, terrorism. Having said that, <clears throat> we also have to, to realize that if we are to ensure long-term stability in Afghanistan and in the region, uh, then we need more uh, than a military solution. We need to make the, uh, the Afghan society, so to speak, inhospitable uh, for uh, terrorists. And to that end, uh, we need to provide uh, the Afghan people with an alternative and better livelihood. And this is the reason why all these things are interconnected. We need to uh, promote uh, economic growth and stimulate a positive economic and social development, uh, create jobs uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so when you ask about the ends of, uh, of this uh, operation, I can tell you it is security. It is to f defend ourself, ourselves against uh, terrorism. But to that end, we need more than just a military solution. We need a positive civilian uh, reconstruction and development uh, of uh, Afghanistan. Thank you. To my left again. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for a, a marvelous talk. Um, you've actually answered part of my question in anticipation uh, and it had to do with how you go about uh, rebuilding the economic infrastructure. And so long as you have the warlords uh, running rampant and uh, basing their economy on the poppy fields and, and related industries, it will be difficult uh, for you to carry out the mission, I would imagine. So my question is, um, are you training a second wave of people to go in uh, on the civilian side to rebuild that infrastructure? What, what are your plans for changing them from, from an opium-based economy to perhaps uh, farms and things of other uh, related nature? Thank you. It is indeed a key uh, question and also a key element uh, in the new strategy 
uh, you now see uh, displayed uh, in Madja, in the Helman uh, province. Um, <clears throat> first, we sent uh, more troops than before uh, to clear the area and to uh, hold uh, the area to provide the necessary security. And immediately after, we provide governance, we provide development assistance, we provide people uh, with uh, an alternative uh, uh, livelihood. We um, um, try uh, to develop uh, alternative crops uh, so that they can get a living uh, from um, cultivating uh, vegetables, uh, wheat, other alternative crops uh, in, in, instead of uh, opium. Um, it is quite a challenge, but the only way forward uh, is to uh, provide development assistance and better governance immediately after uh, we have uh, cleared uh, the district. And that's what is going, out now, uh, going on now uh, in, in the Magia uh, uh, area. And you will see that kind of operation repeated uh, in other parts uh, of uh, Afghanistan. To my right this time. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I agree that the comprehensive approaches is very, very necessary. With the coalition in, um, in Afghanistan, we see that just recently um, that funds, okay, that Ambassador Holbrook is, has been speaking with the, the Georgians, the Latvians, the Estonians, the Croatians, and the Hungarians about making uh, funds available to help train troops uh, to uh, join the NATO's efforts in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's that's commendable. However, at the the other side uh, of the coin, we see uh, some of the uh, NATO members that have have been made uh, major uh, contributions to to the effort. Uh, however, um, in specifically the the Dutch in Ruzgan and the Canadians in Kandahar province, and uh, now. Um, it appears that, that both of these, uh, these countries uh, plan to uh, withdraw uh, their, their troops uh, and their, their peacekeeping efforts there as well. So we, we can see that this Sorry, I'd appreciate it if you'd uh, ask the question. Okay. Um, see that, that the Dutch efforts in Aruzagon were a model for this comprehensive approach to the military and, and, and the civilian. Uh, how will this, um, okay, how, with, uh, with partners withdrawing, how, how will uh, NATO try to uh, maintain some continuity? I understand very well um, your, your question. Um, but let me stress that until now, we have kept this uh, as a full alliance mission. Uh, a mission in which all 28 NATO allies uh, are fully engaged, and they are still. Um, plus, as I told you, 17 partners outside uh, NATO. There is an ongoing discussion in many countries, uh, and we have, of course, seen a very heated discussion uh, in the Netherlands recently and eventually uh, um, they called uh, new uh, elections. Uh, we have also seen a discussion uh, in Canada, but uh, both countries are still represented uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, and let's see uh, what, uh, what, what happens. The facts, the facts on the ground are that during recent months, during the last two, three months, we have seen a strong commitment uh, from allies and partners. When President Obama announced the additional 30,000 American troop contribution to our mission in Afghanistan, other allies and partners followed suit. Actually, um, uh, other allies and partners pledged almost 10,000 extra troops. So the fact is uh, that non-US participants in this mission 
count for, as I said in my speech, 40% of all troops uh, in Afghanistan. It's quite good, I think. And a, a testimony of solidarity and strong commitment. So I'm not that uh, worried. Um, I do believe uh, that uh, we can maintain this uh, operation uh, as an alliance mission um, in which all allies uh, contribute uh, on the basis uh, on uh, the principle of solidarity. Back to this side. Uh, good afternoon, sir. NATO did not intervene during the Russia-Georgia war. I'm curious, um, there's two questions. One is under what circumstances would NATO um, intervene if Russia were to either uh, initiate war or were there to be war again between Russia and Georgia or perhaps Russia and Ukraine? And also, if Georgia were to be given a membership action plan and move for, uh, further towards NATO membership, what role would uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which are only recognized as international states by four countries, I believe, in the world, uh, what role would they play? First of all, let me stress that um, NATO policies um, regarding uh, Georgia and, by the way, also Ukraine, um, uh, are unchanged. As you know, uh, we made a decision uh, at the NATO summit in Bucharest uh, in 2008, uh, a decision according to which Georgia and Ukraine uh, will become members uh, of uh, NATO, uh, obviously provided uh, that they so wish and provided uh, they fulfill the necessary uh, criteria. So that's a clear point of departure, NATO's open door policy uh, will uh, continue. Um, however, uh, we did not reach an agreement within NATO concerning a membership action plan for Georgia and uh, Ukraine. Instead, uh, we have uh, established um, uh, special commissions. Uh, we have uh, uh, a NATO-Georgia commission, we have a NATO-Ukraine uh, commission, and our cooperation uh, with Georgia uh, takes place within uh, this uh, commission. And uh, every year, um, uh, Georgia uh, presents a uh, national and uh, a national program uh, for reforms uh, of the Georgian society, the Geor uh, Georgian uh, armed uh, forces, uh, etc. Uh, so I think we have found a, a good framework. Uh, for uh, uh, the NATO-Georgia uh, uh, cooperation uh, and uh, relationship. You asked me a question about a possible uh, NATO reaction uh, to uh, uh, intervention uh, from uh, Russian side or uh, a new aggression uh, from uh, Russia. Um, I think it would be premature uh, to uh, make any statements concerning um, NATO reactions um, uh, in, 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 in that uh, case. We urge uh, Russia to fulfill uh, her international uh, obligations uh, and um, uh, we uh, stick uh, to uh, the non-recognition policy uh, regarding South Ossetia uh, and uh, Abkhazia. Thank you. We have time for one more question and I'll go back to my right. Thank you, and uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary General. As the previous question and the previous gentleman alluded to, there's frustration growing, especially among Western partners, with the progress of the war in Afghanistan. And a large part of that discontent is engendered by what's seen as failures of the Karzai government to provide for its own security and to provide for the pillars of society that you talked about in your speech. And I'm wondering if you would address what NATO is doing and can be doing to encourage Afghani forces and Afghani security troops to take over from NATO, co from NATO and from alliance forces where they can and allow for Afghani action to be taken on the more peaceful pillars of society where much international work that obviously cannot be permanent is going on at the moment. 
Um, I do realize uh, that uh, 2009 was a very uh, difficult uh, year and we experienced many uh, setbacks uh, in, in Afghanistan. But I do believe that we will see progress, that we will see a new momentum uh, in 2010 for several reasons. Firstly, uh, we have decided to increase the number of international troops significantly by 40,000. Um, and of course, the number of troops uh, matters. Uh, it will make uh, a, a, a difference. Secondly, uh, we have decided to assist uh, the Afghan government in the development of the capacity of the Afghan security forces. Um, uh, actually, we have set the goal to reach a level of 300,000 Afghan soldiers and police by October 2011. Um, uh, and to that end, uh, we need uh, to train and educate uh, Afghan soldiers and Afghan police. And this is a reason why our training mission uh, is so uh, essential. So that's the second uh, part of all this. Thirdly, uh, we have, uh, the international commu community has uh, committed itself uh, to more development assistance uh, to Afghanistan. And in that respect, President Karzai and his government have also uh, committed themselves to better governance uh, and notably strengthen fight against corruption and uh, drug uh, trade. So all these elements will, in my opinion, uh, create new momentum uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, and as you rightly uh, pointed out, the perspective should be to hand over responsibility to the Afghans themselves. Let me make clear that we will stay in Afghanistan as long as it takes to finish our job. But obviously, that is not forever. I'm very often asked, when will our mission in Afghanistan end? And my answer is clear. Our mission in Afghanistan will end when the Afghans are capable to take responsibility for the security themselves and run the country themselves. And the more we invest in this transition to Afghan lead responsibility now, the more we invest now, the sooner the date when they will be able to take over uh, themselves. So this is the true perspective. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel that we hand over in a gradual process, lead responsibility to the Afghans, province by province, when conditions permit. And I do believe that this process uh, can and will start uh, this year. And let me conclude uh, with a positive story about progress uh, in Afghanistan. Positive stories are very often overshadowed by negative news. I'm not complaining about it, it's just a fact of life. Um, but the fact is um, that uh, the educational system has been developed and improved significantly uh, in Afghanistan. We have constructed 3,500 schools. Seven million students go to school, out of which one third are girls. In the past, they couldn't even get an education. The health system has been improved. Today, 85% of the Afghan population has access to basic health uh, services. Child mortality has uh, declined drastically. We have uh, constructed 13,000 kilometers of roads, a very critical infrastructure if we are to promote uh, economic uh, development. Five million Afghan refugees have returned uh, home. Um, just to illustrate uh, that we see progress uh, in Afghanistan, but we have to do much more, and this is the reason why we need the comprehensive approach, a strengthened military effort as we have decided, and strengthened civilian um, development and reconstruction. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Secretary General Rasmussen. Uh, I only regret that we don't have more time for more questions. On behalf of the University of Chicago, thank you very much for coming and giving such a fine speech and taking the questions. Thank you very much.
Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.